hello everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to present to you once again on another technical topic. Uh, it's necessarily uh, quite a technical topic I will be addressing and I'll be going into some depth, particularly in, in relation to the medical regulatory aspects, which is a bit of a recurrent theme. Uh, so Tim, if you can, uh, as usual, jump in at any point and ask pertinent questions and so forth and clarifications. And we'll I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best to make it as exciting and controversial and sexy as possible, Jeff. Yeah, uh, we'll see, we'll see how we go. <laughs> yeah. So this is a slide we keep coming back to time and time again, just showing a few examples of medical devices that Genesis has been involved mm -hmm. in development. And we really should update this because, you know, we are involved in a whole heap more than this at the moment. Um, Unfortunately, most of our sexy ones, we really um, are constrained by confidentiality, so we can't say too much about them or even identify them. But, uh, no, but we're doing virtual rehab, virtual reality, brain stroke rehabilitation, radiation dosimetry, cell and gene therapy, you know, just to drop a few names. So this is just an example. Yeah. These are particularly good examples, um, particularly the, with the exception of the CT injector, which was cable linked. All of the other devices have radio linkage using Bluetooth and or Wi-Fi and or wide area communications networks. So they all happen to be pretty good examples of radio link devices. And I'll be talking about the broad electromagnetic compatibility requirements and obligations, but with a particular emphasis on what that means when you extend to a RF based wirelessly linked device. So what is the fundamental objective? Sorry, Jeff, of can I just ask, before you start, yeah, can I ask you a question? Amongst the active market, would virtually all medical devices today have some sort of sort form of, like, it, it, it's not a one, one relationship between having connectivity. You can still have electromagnetic issues when there's no connectivity, correct? Oh, absolutely. Any electrical device has EMC obligations. And that's commercial devices as well as medical. So there's no restriction in that regard. But the the radio brings additional requirements because of the radio transmission aspects. But to put things in perspective, looking at what Genesis does, we don't have a single job on our books in a medical space that does not involve connectivity of some sort or other. And it's not that we necessarily seek out those devices. So it is our core skill set in the internet of things domain. So it's probably natural that those sort of projects come our way. But I think it's a pretty fair bet to say there would be very few medical devices for active medical devices, i.e. electrically powered with some form of intelligent control that don't have some form of connectivity. And I'd probably go so far to say as anyone who's doing such a device and doesn't include connectivity, it's probably making a pretty basic mistake. So it's becoming fairly universal. Um, so what, are, what is electromagnetic compatibility? And I'll we'll look at some of the definitions in more detail, but uh, just putting it really simply to make sure that any electrically powered device does not generate electromagnetic signals, AKA radio waves that might disturb other equipment. And conversely, to make sure that your device is not disturbed by electromagnetic signals generated by other equipment. So you might say, well, if one bit of equipment satisfies that, why does the other have to? Well, it's all a case of degree. It's impossible to reduce electromagnetic emissions to zero. It's a case of reducing them to a level that has been deemed to allow devices to be co-located and on the whole operate satisfactorily without interfering with one another. Although that's not an absolute guarantee and there are always situations where you will get interference problems. But the standards are aimed at making sure that that issue is minimized. Um, yeah, can I just ask, this is kind of uh, a little bit off topic, but it's something that I've been meaning to ask you for a long time and never got around to. When you're driving along in your car with your radio on and you go through some particular set of traffic lights or a, a tunnel or uh, somewhere and your radio starts, you know, buzzing ferociously and it's so annoying uh, until you get past this particular spot, what's going on there? Well, there are two actually two phenomena and in the old days of AM radio, you used to drive past a TV transmitting tower and it would get severely interfered with. So that's interference of the radio signal from another high powered radio signal nearby. So that's one phenomenon.
but driving your vehicle, you're more likely to suffer a thing called multipath interference, where the signal, when you're entering into a confined space, you get signals bouncing around and they can interfere with each other. So it's the actual signal you're wanting to receive going by multipath um, propagation um, pathways that cause interference patterns to be generated. So it's a, a, a complicated topic. So, um, but certainly you'll end up with situations where you'll end up with a particular buzzing interference that may be an external device. So, that's, a, so when you're going into car parks. substations, good example. When you're going to car, car, car parks, you know, that's the Latin example of the latter. Yeah, that's multipath where the signal's being perturbed by the fact you're in a Why space. are car parks so, much, so different, for example, than a hospital ward? Um, probably the fact that the nature they've got um, concrete, uh, reinforced concrete conductive surfaces and lots of apertures and that really promotes the propagation of radio waves by these different pathways. Whereas when you get into a more confined space, it's actually there are less individual pathways. So something like, a radi would something like a radiation bunker in a hospital be particularly problematic then in that regard or? Uh, well, I would imagine so because it's designed to produce, to prevent egress of harmful radiation generated within the bunker. So it's almost like a shielded cage, Faraday cage you might've heard of. Yeah. Um, so okay, anyway, well, that's the fund fundamental objective is so that electronic devices or electrical devices can coexist in the environment and not interfere or disturb each other's operation. And I noticed that little uh, one there, electrostatic discharge as well. That's a little- Yeah, I put that in specifically because that's a, a slightly different form of interference, electric zaps that we're all familiar with, that is particularly problematic for electronic devices, can cause microcontrollers to reset, for example, and can cause physical damage. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, question often arises about use of radio frequency technology in medical devices. What is allowable? For example, can you have radio transmitters in intensive care wards or in operating theatres, for example. Um, this is an area where there's no, there are no hard and fast regulatory standards that say what you can and can't do. It's all a case of degree of risk and risk management. Uh, as in most things medical, the FDA takes a pretty lead role in providing guidance information. Um, and it's in terms of guidance to industry and also to their staff so I can thoroughly recommend having a look at FDA guideline papers where there are no regulatory standards that specifically say what you can and can't do. So I've just got a little screen cap of a scope of that document and you can see the um, URL reference there, but uh, it's particularly helpful in analysing what the pros and cons and constraints are in using different radio technologies in different environments. From my point of view, I'm very comfortable using Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, for example, in the majority of environments in the care situation. I start to get a little bit concerned if I'm looking at an intensive care ward that's got lots of electronic equipment that potentially can be interfered with or can cause interference, and even more so in an operating theatre, particularly if you've got uh, a patient that's connected up to uh, conductive catheters, for example. So I would, I would be extremely concerned if someone, for example, were to take a cell phone device and try and use the cell phone 4G or 5G connectivity in an operating theatre. I think that's asking for trouble. But uh, to use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi in those environments, people are doing so. But nevertheless, be aware that you need to be very careful about the risks of use of that technology. In some what, of more sensitive environments. Why is Bluetooth and Wi-Fi okay, but not 4G? Mainly because the radiated power levels are quite low by comparison with a 4G transmitter. You're talking about tens of milliwatts vis-a-vis -vis watts of transmitted peak power. So it's really just the power levels that makes a difference. And, that also, power, and how does that power relate to interference? Well, it can effectively induce electrical signals in conductors. So for example, if you use your cell phone right next to a catheter going into a patient's heart, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that you could generate electrical signals that could actually disturb their heart function by using the cell phone in that situation. Um, so it's the radio waves generate electrical signals in conductors. Um, so there's a, also there's, there is a 
growing uh, amount of evidence of existing products using Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in those scenarios without uh, ill effects. So it reduces the risk from the point of view of familiarity. Um, but I would suggest anyone who's contemplating a medical device using wireless technology to consult that FDA paper and there are other sources of information just to come to learn what you have to come to grips with in terms of that approach. So having a look at the regulatory landscape, um, we've got the quality system and ISO 149 risk management at the top. These standards in themselves do not specifically prescribe electromagnetic compatibility compliance, but they do call up the application of relevant standards, which brings us back to our favourite 60601-1, which is the headline standard for electrical medical equipment, and it calls up a subsidiary standard 60601-1-2, which is the core electromagnetic compatibility standard for medical devices. Uh, and it is it calls up in turn a whole series of other EMC standards, in particular the IEC 61000 series, which are globally recognised and harmonised EMC standards applying broadly across all products, including medical. So we're not delving into a completely different regulatory regime here. We're effectively applying commercial standards into the medical space, and there are a few particular requirements and how that's done. And in terms of radio communications, there are a range of standards recognised by ACMA for Australia, FCC for US, C for Europe, that recognise particular standards for radio devices in their jurisdictions. We'll be looking at it in a little more detail during the presentation. Uh, I promise I'll be moving on from ranting about standards in due course. So 60601-1 section 17 is the section that calls up collateral standard 60601-1-2 and I won't labour on the detail here but I've reproduced clause 17 and, and we make this slide deck available so don't bother about furiously trying to scribble the stuff down if you're interested in the space. Um, so the Pacific clause in 17 uh, says why we are doing this and really uh, 60601-1 is a recipe book that calls up all the ingredients in the form of all of the other standards that re refer to specific aspects. So for those who are familiar with the uh, EMC requirements, the core standard called up is CISPR 11, which is one of the CISPR standards of for um, electromagnetic magnetic compatibility for radiated radio waves and also there is a standard for specific for electrostatic discharge and a suite of standards for immunity that we'll have a look at in a bit of detail. Yeah, if I saw down the bottom you um, recommend you had to generate certain yeah, documents. Yeah, I'll talk to that in more detail. I've got a slide specifically yeah, on okay. my, my recommended approach to how to comply with these standards and their requirements. Yeah. Okay doing well for time. Uh, this is a slide I've reproduced from a 60601-1 presentation and I won't labour on it but it's really just to provide evidence that each of the jurisdictions that uh, I've listed there and many others by one means or another either mandate or recognise the particular standards we're talking about. So this gives you linkage to back when someone asks why do we have to comply with 60601-1-2, we can trace that back through a coherent pathway that links it back to the requirements of the particular regulators in the particular jurisdictions. And I think it's important to do that because we can just take for granted, oh, we've got to comply with this standard, that standard and the other standard, but it really does pay to understand why that is the case, not just accept everyone's word for it to say that's just what you do, but there is a documented trail back through the pathway, excuse me, that we can link back to a firm require, documented requirement of the individual regulators. So that uh, says number one, why we have to do this, and number two, that if we do do this, we are on sound grounds in terms of satisfying the requirements of those regulators. 
So I'll just put up here the general requirements because electromagnetic compatibility and radio communications compliance uh, covers not just medical, but any device that's electrically powered essentially has to meet requirements of regulators for EMC, uh, radio, radio communications compliance in terms of not interfering with other radio devices, but also human safety in terms of not exposing human beings to excessive levels of electromagnetic radiation. I also find it quite amusing that this applies to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, which are extremely low power, but people are perfectly happy to put a cell phone transmitting several watts against their ear right next to their cranial cavity. So it gets a little bit silly when you're talking about a um, Bluetooth sensor, for example, worn on your leg that's out, outputting tiny amounts of power vis-a-vis -vis a cell phone stuck in your ear. So it gets a little bit out of balance at times. Not, not, not to mention people's acceptance of x-rays and CT scans and uh, line-act machines in radiology, um, radiotherapy, which puts out you know, several orders of magnitude more. And people are worried about 50 hertz fields from overhead power lines, but they're perfectly happy to lie on an electric blanket that puts thousands, uh, tens of thousands of times a higher electric field into their body than an overhead power line because of the nature of electromagnetic fields so they fall off. So there's just a human perception of the risk is just completely skewed in terms of something that's big and hairy that looks like a transmissions line. It's got to be much more dangerous than an electric blanket. Anyway, different topic. So we can link back the need to comply with these standards, not just to the medical requirements, but also to the commercial or requirements of commercial products. And most of the requirements are the same, um, interestingly enough. So we're not dealing with anything too dramatically different in the medical space, with a few exceptions, um, particularly in relation to susceptibility and disruption of operation, which can become quite critical. So having a look at uh, 6601-1-2, I've just reproduced the scope here. And it's a recurrent theme that we've already talked about, about not causing interference to other devices and not suffering from mal effects through being disturbed by other devices. So that is a consistent theme throughout the standards and the definitions. I won't labor on that. It's just there as a handy reference. So we need to look at some key definitions, and this is uh, particularly for those who are not uh, technical practitioners who, who may have been um, gluttons for punishment in listening to this presentation. So uh, let's imagine the compatibility, ability of devices to cooperate in the environment without causing interference to each other through, to, through electromagnetic radiation. Uh, electromagnetic disturbances and electromagnetic phenomenon and this is, most people would know this is radio waves, but it also includes microwaves, X-rays, therapeutic radiation, and light. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the spectrum extends from DC up to cosmic rays, and they all are different radio wavelengths and different energy levels from the lower frequencies are very low energy per quantum of energy, of of radiation, whereas cosmic rays have huge amounts of energy per quantum of radiation. But they are all part of electromagnetic radiation and the same phenomenon, and that also includes magnetism. Uh, electromagnetic emission is transmission of radio waves, essentially, electromagnetic energy. Uh, immunity is the ability to tolerate being irradiated by radio waves without suffering ill effects. And electrostatic discharge is a slightly different form, but it's your static zap. We'll all be familiar with combing your hair on a dry day and then getting a zap when you touch doorknob, little spark discharge. So it's effectively that phenomenon. And that can be quite devastating for electronic devices if not properly managed. So looking at a little more detail about the issue of electromagnetic disturbances or emissions that we are trying to prevent. So we're trying to stop our device from generating radio waves. And I've just listed the standards there that are called up by 1-1-2 for different forms of radio emissions. 
So radiated radio waves like your radio that you listen to or your TV signal are covered by data called CISPR-11 uh, and also conducted radio frequency emissions. So radio waves can actually come along cables as well as through the air. So they're also covered by that standard and it prescribes frequencies and levels that are tolerable uh, and deemed to not be high risk of causing interference to other devices. We have a couple of mains standards as well. So harmonics generating noisy harmonic waveforms that you send back out on the mains cable and voltage fluctuations and flicker. So if you've got things that can, you might experience clicks when someone switches a light switch, that's because of a transient pulse of signal that is generated when a device turns on and off. So there are standards for the levels of tolerable interference that you generate of this sort and you must manage that by having suppression devices in your design. Yeah. <clears throat> Jeff, are you going to, in the course of your presentation, give us a, a sort of a top 10 list of the most likely sources of uh, EMC that is going to cause a disturbance in the design of electronics? Yeah, I will indeed. I'll do that down at the, the very last slide is having some of the detailed um, design approaches that you can use to prevent the most likely causes <laughs> Yeah. of generating emissions or suffering um, uh, susceptibility to other people's emissions. Yeah, so for example, just, you know, listening around the office, I hear people talking about, you know, well, we've got to get the, make sure the switch mode power supply doesn't cause the problem. So there are certain... Common mode chokes and pie filters and suppression capacitors yeah. and so, so forth. Are yourself. you going to go down to that level or...? I, I will, I, only at the a very superficial consideration yeah. of that. I'm not going down to the detailed design level because I think that will probably turn most of our audience off. Yeah, okay. But if anyone's interested in that, then I'd be perfectly happy to do another more detailed technical presentation looking deeper under the hood about or even specific just, techniques. Or even just, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you'd be happy to talk to people. Sure, absolutely. Very happy to share freely. Yeah, so <clears throat> those, those are the standards and the issues with generation of emissions. When we look at susceptibility, it's kind of the inverse of that. So any, if one device can generate an emission, then another device by definition can be susceptible to it. So in this instance, we're trying to not be disturbed by, uh, by the signals generated by other devices that can cause your device to be upset. And I've listed the standards there. I won't go through them uh, in any great detail, except to note that there are some that apply to all devices, some that apply only to mains connected devices. Battery powered devices also different from cable connected devices because obviously you don't have cables connected to a battery powered device. You don't have to have a concern about signals getting in by cables. You're only concerned about signals getting in by transmission through the atmosphere or through the, the ether as they used to call it. Um, just one thing to note in terms of immunity, it's not an absolute thing. The manufacturer must determine what is an acceptable level of disruption of operation that you can tolerate. So for example, you might have a fairly uh, benign function, a device is just doing a bit of sensing or monitoring. If it gets a static zap and then its microcontroller resets and it resumes operation, you might actually deem that that's an acceptable disruption. On the other hand, if you've got a life support system, for example, a respiratory ventilator, and a static zap causes its microcontroller to reset and stop ventilating, that could be a potentially catastrophic event. So it's a case of degree of risk and what level of disruption is tolerable. But on the whole, anything that causes permanent damage is pretty much unacceptable. Generally, things that cause a disruption to operation or an erroneous measurement to occur are not tolerable. But in some cases, they just a temporary disruption from which you recover might be deemed tolerable. And then you, it becomes a case of how much expense and difficulty do you go to to prevent those varying degrees of disruption from occurring. So you do, you do have to make a judgment about what's acceptable. But the safe way to go is to say that no, dis, no disruption can be tolerated and then, then you won't have a problem in terms of regula regulators, but you might have a problem in terms of your design complying. So if we have a specific look at Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, sorry, and I must say what I've talked sorry, about Jeff, so far. Just, just interrupt for a second. There is a uh, question for, um, in the chat. Um, 
from Sam Van Bellman. Uh, he says, I am planning an early stage clinical safety study using a non-regulated medical device in an acute stroke ward. The device uses RF to wirelessly stream data via Bluetooth. Does our device need to pass EMC compliance testing? So I guess the quest key question there is it's, it's in a clinical safety study, um, early stage pre-regulatory approval. So what's, what's the comment there? Well, the best answer to that is what does the ethics committee that's regulating the trial or in, in control of the trial say? Normally, you would expect that uh, they would not require you to necessarily have gone through all of the formal compliance testing, but they will want you to assure them that your device is not going to cause interference in that environment. If you're dealing with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or standard communications techniques, and particularly if you're using off-the-shelf devices or standard modules, I would have a look for what else is used in that environment. And if there are other Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices that are acceptable for use in that environment, then you are on pretty firm grounds to be able to put forth an argument to the Ethics Committee to say that you've assessed it, done an engineering assessment, you have a high degree of confidence that it is compliant with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth standards, and that Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is acceptable in that environment, Therefore, you have an argument that the risk is acceptably low. But I would be extremely cautious in a critical care environment uh, to make sure that I'm not going in with something that is going to cause a problem. Um, gets more the more critical care, more critical the environment, obviously, the higher the risk. But at the end of the day, it's really the responsibility of the onus is on the ethics committee to give their clearance for use of that technology at its evolutionary state in terms of its regulatory compliance. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And do just, if you've got a question, throw it up and we'll answer it straight away. So what I've talked about to date applies to any electrical device. What I'm going to talk about now is specific for devices which have transmitters in them, essentially, so radio communications devices. So the ones you'll come across most commonly are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but also near-field communications. And that includes techniques for transmission through body tissues, for example, cochlear implant communication with an implanted device or communicating with an implanted uh, defibrillator or pacemaker to monitor it and control it. That uses magnetic field coupling, typically through the tissue. So near field communications is included. And there are also other use cases, for example, 900 megahertz ISM devices that potentially can be used that have their own set of requirements. So I've listed some of the key technical regulations that apply for Australia, for US and also for EU. And this considers two aspects. One is how much power you can transmit in a particular um, frequency band. And spectral purity means how much are you transmitting of, of rogue signals outside of the allowed band. And that's very, those limits are very tightly controlled so your device communicating in your operating theater or in your hospital environment doesn't interfere with radio communications or cell phone communications, for example. And of course, the same applies generally across any use scenario for any electrical device. Are you going to interfere with someone else's radio device? The second set of standards refer to radio frequency energy exposure. So is the radio energy going to be effectively a threat? To a human being and this term is determined not only by the amount of energy that you're transmitting how powerful your radio transmitter is but how close the antenna is to the person's body and also the duty cycle they are transmitting continuously over 24 7 or are you just transmitting very infrequent bursts maybe for a short treatment period so it's, a, it's the net amount of energy uh, to which the human body is exposed generally is the primary concern, but also the peak energy. For example, a microwave um, oven can easily fry your eyeballs, so you've got to be careful about uh, extreme events like that, but also long-term concerns. Um, tissue heating is one phenomenon, also concerns about potential causes of cancer, although the, the jury is well and truly out on whether there is a link between devices such as cell phones and potential for brain cancer. Um, I've mentioned their diagnostic and therapeutic radiation, which are 
still intentional radiators, but it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but they have their own set of standards uh, that are called up by 60601-1. So for x-rays and for radio treatment and so forth and so forth. But they are really beyond the scope of what we're talking about in terms of these communications type radio devices. So that just sort of sets the scene in terms of what we're dealing with. And I'm, I'm not going to labor in further detail on that, but if anyone else has got, anyone's got any specific questions I'd like to raise, I'll try my best to answer them or handle that offline. Uh, I'll share my email address at the end for any particular detailed considerations. What I've got here is effectively a practical pathway to achieving compliance with EMC and radio communications aspects of a medical device and more broadly, essentially to any device, but this is with a particular focus on medical. So it's a typical design and development pathway that you will follow for the totality of the device development, but looking at the particular EMC aspects. So a good starting point is to say, well, what are the system requirements for radio wireless communications. And you can also take into consideration what is the EMS electromagnetic, path, uh, electromagnetic compliance profile of the device. Is it battery powered? Is it mains powered? Does it have high power levels in it? These all affect the difficulty of EMC compliance. So having to find what the requirements are, particularly for radio communications and the general EMC requirements EMC aspects you're likely to consider to determine your EMC certification pathway in, in conjunction with your compliance consultant or expert. In other words, what do I have to do to achieve EMC and radio communications compliance in each of the countries or jurisdictions where I want to sell my medical device and create a documented plan for that as part of your overall compliance strategy. Then look in a little bit more detail, which EMC regulations do I have to comply with in order to achieve certification? And in most cases, it would require consultation with the test lab. Very few organizations have the skill set and capability to be able to do this in isolation. Even at Genesis, which is our bread and butter doing this compliance, we will still consult with the test lab because the standards and regulations change with time. The test labs are the experts and they will have the latest information at their fingertips. So we will normally go to them with our, with our regulatory compliance plan and ask them to assess that to make sure that we've got everything or the boxes correctly ticked. Uh, in doing so, don't expect free consultancy from the test lab. Expect to pay them for this service. Um, generally, I find if you do commission the test lab to do your testing, they will actually provide this level of service within the context of that purchase order. So they will look at your compliance plan and then give you commentary on it. So the reason for having a, a documented regulatory compliance plan is multifold. It firstly drives your process for your project development, but it will be extremely positively looked upon by the regulator that you have actually thought this through and planned it out in detail, not just doing it on an ad hoc basis. So once that overall plan is in place, you can have a look at the design inputs relating to EMC, electromagnetic compliance, uh, and also radio compliance, and in particular, risk control measures. So having a look at the environment your device is operating in, is it likely to cause interference to other devices? And conversely, are there likely to be other devices in that environment that will interfere with your device? And taking Tim's example of the radio therapy bunker where you've got a linear accelerator generating extremely high energy x-rays or gamma radiation in that environment, uh, it's likely that that device will have a high power power supply in it that may generate spurious radiation that may block Bluetooth or Wi-Fi communications, for example. So just assess the environment and say, are there sources in that that could disrupt my device? And conversely, are there highly sensitive devices, for example, in an operating theater that my device might interfere with. So having yeah, done how, that how assessment. Would you, how would you go about, you know, in that example you gave, how would you go about determining if there was um, potential for, you know, interference with your device? 
Well, just firstly, by having technical knowledge and, and assessing what you think might be a problem, then doing research on the internet to see if there are other discussion papers, for example, that address this. And, and uh, that FCC paper that I identified goes partway down that path, down that track. Um, when you really get to the rubber hitting the road, if you're unsure, I would be taking measurements in that environment. I'd be going in and having a look at levels of RF interference. So take a spectrum analyzer in there, being careful that that doesn't cause its own problems and measuring signal levels, for example. Uh, so if you can't find information through research, actually do measurements as part of that risk assessment. Right, and with the design inputs relating to EMC, um, when you do the design inputs, uh, would you separate out the EMC aspects of it? Like, a, or, or is that sort of just integrated with all the other um, uh, design inputs? I would, in terms of the regulatory compliance obligation, have a separate section under which standards you need to comply with. But also throughout the design inputs, you're looking at risk control measures where you may wish to have specific measures in place to control emissions or specific measures in place to deal with susceptibility. If you have particular, a particularly susceptible device, for example, one with very low level electrical signals reading like an EMG device or something, you really do need to take EMC very seriously. And so your design inputs would have particular requirements if you're aware of sensitivities in particular parts of your circuit or your design to deal with those particular aspects. So you would have a combination of a section dealing with the macro level regulatory compliance obligation, but then dotted throughout the design inputs, you may have elements that relate to particular EMC concerns. So having determined your design inputs, you then know what you need to do to comply and know where your risk areas are. At that point in time, we prepare our EMC verification plan and protocol, which defines in detail what we're going to do to achieve EMC compliance for our product. At that point in a project, and this is generally quite early on, before generally before we've even started the detailed design, we would submit that to the test lab and ask them for a formal quote for EMC testing. This is to a multifold benefit from this. Firstly, you're finding out early what you're facing in terms of your project cost and timeline, and I'll put some dot points on that at the bottom, but also engaging with the test lab, they will gain confidence that you're taking your EMC obligations seriously and that you are well organized in what you're doing. And this inevitably will lead to your minimum quote. So they'll sharpen their pencil if they know that you really know what you're doing and that you've got it uh, well covered and well planned and they're not going to be facing a huge level of uncertainty in terms of what they're actually testing. And the verification plan and protocol includes such things as identifying all of your system component parts, as placeholders for all of the detailed technical design documentation that you need to submit to the test lab and considers things such as typical usage scenarios that are going to be used for doing the EMC testing. So you're providing as much information to the lab as you can to let them reduce their level of uncertainty and hence give you the minimum quote. And you're also gaining conf the confidence of the lab that when they get to the point of doing the testing that that will be a smooth process and with a high degree of likelihood of compliance. So from that point, when you start looking at detailed design, you build in your emissions control and immunity protection measures from the start. And I've got another slide looking at a few of the electronic design details that are particular touch points in this space. So your electronic circuits design EMC measures at their core. So don't just design your circuit and then tack a bit of EMC protection on afterwards. And I will relate um, an uh, interesting scenario that uh, meeting I was present with Tim at with a customer asking about their product and their compliance and in the meeting having a look at their circuit schematic and pointing out a whole raft of areas where I had concerns and asking them if they'd, if they'd done, done EMC testing to which the answer was no. Uh, the advice was to rapidly get some testing done and guess what found out a whole heap of problems just through a quick Look at the circuit schematics in five minutes. It's possible to tell if EMC treatment measures have been built in. So having designed our circuit with that approach, we then subject engineering prototypes to pre-compliance testing. 
So at Genesis, we've got quite extensive facilities in house in terms of spectrum analyzers. We have TEM cell for measuring uh, EMC emissions and ESD generating devices. And we have the, they're not calibrated, but we actually have them benchmarked against known test reports from calibrated laboratories. So we've got pretty high degree of confidence in the results we get from our in-house measurements. But where we have any doubt, we would then do pre-compliance testing at a test house or a test lab, an open range EMC test range, for example, to get high degree of confidence. I would recommend any designer who doesn't have the in-house facilities or confidence in them, in their engagement with the test lab to arrange to do pre-compliance testing at the earliest opportunity. And generally it's enough to book one day in the open test range and the test lab will provide an operator, they'll provide the test equipment and they will also help in terms of expertise in helping you interpret results. So you can spend one, a few thousand dollars for one day in a test range and save tens of thousands of dollars having to remediate and retest a non-compliance product under duress at the end of the project. So having, having done the in-house testing, we remediate any issues. At Genesis, I'd say 50% of our designs pass first go with no, no, no need to change anything. The remaining 50%, we need to do some adjustment, maybe changing some component values to toughen up um, the EMC emissions protection, maybe reducing rise time on high-speed digital signals. We normally build in provision for series resistors and shunt capacitors so that we can optimize the EMC suppression of each of the circuits while still maintaining adequate performance. So there'll be a little bit of most designs or at least 50% of designs we do, there'll be a bit of tweaking. In terms of designs that have outright failed on their formal compliance assessment, I would say one out of 10 uh, of designs that we've done historically would have to do a second round of testing. And that's normally through something that's either been marginal that we were happy to take a punt on or in a, wor a worst case, something which is a straight oversight. But uh, we generally pride ourselves on getting the vast majority of our designs through the EMC tests with a clean bill of health on the first pass. So having remediated the design, then we go to our pre-production prototypes, which build in any of those EMC uh, correction measures, plus obviously any other design changes that one makes after testing prototypes. And they would normally be submitted to the test lab for formal evaluation. And if in doubt, we would repeat pre-compliance testing before the formal evaluation. Mor moral of the story, before you submit formal testing, have an extremely high degree of confidence that your design is going to pass. Otherwise, you're just up for excessive costs and time scale pressure for something that could be avoided. And finally, we take the EMC test reports from the labs and produce an overall encompassing EMC verification report because there will be multiple reports against each of the standards for the electromagnetic emissions, the susceptibility, and also the radio communications compliance. So you may have up to six or eight different reports. So we will then write an overall, an overarching verification report that effectively summarizes those documents and then presents them to the regulatory assessor in a nice organized and palatable format. So they know what they're looking at. And of course that report links back to the plan and has a checklist in it to say everything that was done in the plan has actually been dealt with and is addressed in the report and that we have obviously past all of the requirements which we've tested. Jeff, can I just ask, um, I, I was really interested in you saying that, you know, 50% of the designs need adjustment. Um, you know, knowing the rigor, rigor with which we do our designs, is there a, um, there's obviously a little bit of an art form here. It's not a clear cut, you know, do this and, you know, control, it's not that easy. What, what's going on there? Well, that's part of it, but it's also the fact we build in EMC suppression measures and that brings a cost with it. And we'll often run without certain components fitted to see if we achieve adequate performance and only fit those additional components if there's a need. Really good example is EMC suppression capacitors and chokes. More particularly on power supplies, for example, you might have a common mode choke, which might be a multi-dollar component and you might we would often put in that as a provision with zero ohm resistor links bypassing it 
We'll test without the choke using the zero ohm links, and if it passes, we can save the cost of the choke. So it's a tweaking issue in optimizing performance versus cost. And in things like rise time of signals, you, you, if you've got a high speed SPI bus, for example, if you put excessive EMC filtering on it, you reduce the rise time and you may degrade the actual performance of the bus. So you'll often go in with a minimum small value filtering capacitors. And if you have an emissions issue, you might put higher value capacitors, which will reduce your rise time and take you closer to the cusp of starting to degrade performance. But you want to tweak that and optimize it. And in the worst case, you might want to run your bus at a lower speed if you get an excessive emissions. So it's really a case of you build in the provisions into the design from day one, but then you want to tweak and optimize them to achieve compliance with adequate margin, but at minimum cost and minimum perhaps impact on other aspects of the system operation. So that's a long winded answer to say, yes, it's actually, it's a science and an art and an yeah, awful lot of I, gut feel. I, I, no, I appreciate that because, you know, when you do a presentation like this, you sort of, you, you get a sense or you just have to go through the a, a tick box process. But um, that little insight as to what you actually do uh, in a in a project, uh, I think gives all of the audience a bit of a, a deeper insight as to, you know, you know, what's actually going on. So that was that was really useful. Thanks. But, I mean, it's just through experience and knowledge gained with that experience, I can look at a circuit schematic for pretty much any device and tell you pretty much within minutes if there are major emissions issues with that design that haven't been addressed just by looking at inputs to switch mode power supplies and outputs from switch mode power supplies, seeing an absence of any suppression provisions, I would almost guarantee that that will fail. It's clear cut as that. When you put all the provisions in place, you can't guarantee it's gonna pass, but you can probably say that circuit design with a well-constructed circuit board layout, I would say 90% probability that is gonna pass, but there's still some residual uncertainty. Um, but that only comes with knowledge and experience and the inexperienced designer who is not taken an EMC design as the core, core approach to their designs almost certainly will produce designs that won't comply. It's pretty clear cut. So it's really easy to fail, um, not so easy to guarantee pass. I often get asked the question of budget. If you have a device that's got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and mains powered with all of the EMC emissions and susceptibility requirements, you can think of budgeting up to 50,000 bucks for test lab costs. And that sounds a lot, and there are ways to reduce it, for example, by using pre-compliant modules and so forth. But worst case scenario, that's the sort of dollars you may be facing. For a simple device, a non-radio device, you might get away with under 20, 20K for test lab costs, but it's still a substantial cost. In terms of timeline, expect for a radio type device, typically six weeks of elapsed time for actually doing the tests, but beware the labs are often heavily booked and you may have backlogs of months before you get a slot in the lab. So don't wait till you're doing your final uh, prototype or pre-production um, pre prototype verification to start thinking about booking a test lab slot. Think about doing that at the earliest opportunity and make sure you can lock that in. Of course, you've got a problem if you've got time scale uncertainty, maybe you can give the test lab a heads up and they can give you a window and at least give you advice. So you then know when you need to make that booking so that you're not gonna be held up waiting for your EMC test results. And as I mentioned before, by doing pre-compliance tests and having a high degree of confidence of the pass, you then avoid the huge problem if you have to make design changes and iterate that through the test process. So uh, emphasize, engage with the test lab early and often and expect to pay them for advice, not to treat them as a free consulting service. So I won't labor the point here, but this is a little, a little detail of those plans I mentioned. And there's no recipe for these. These are Genesis in-house standards that, or in-house approach. And we have templated documents for these that we use project after project. So regulatory compliance plan is saying, what's the overall way we're going to achieve compliance and certification with the regulators? 
vis-a-vis -vis the EMC verification plan and protocol is how we're going to demonstrate that our device technically meets the requirements of the applicable standards. So the first document is for use as part of your regulatory compliance pathway and the second document is for use by the test lab to know how you're going to go about verifying that document and you also use it for your own in-house pre-compliance test. And finally, a report just summarising everything that you've done so that the regulator can see that report and have an in instant way of seeing what you've done for EMC verification. So by following this, uh, this approach, you make life so much easier for your assessor and also for your own quality systems auditor that they will see this stuff and it really makes their job easy. And the easier their job is, the more likely they are to be sympathetic to you in doing the assessment. I just mentioned some accredited test labs. These are NADA accredited labs in Australia. And I also mentioned the NRTL program, which is a US based program for global recognition of test labs. And there are also mutual recognition between individual countries. For example, NADA accredited labs are recognized in many other countries and the NRTL kind of all pulls that together. The ones I've listed there are labs that I have had testing done by with satisfactory results. I haven't had a lot of bad experiences, one or two more in the electrical safety space, but certainly EMC Technologies, Ossist Laboratories and TV Singapore all have done very good job for us in terms of EMC testing. So it's a case of be aware of the labs, maybe get competitive quotes from the labs. I like to form a relationship with the laboratory and a particular people within the laboratory so that we can go with, uh, we would do maybe a, a dozen a year um, EMC testing processes and having that rapport with the people makes it so much easier for everybody because you, they know what you're doing, you know what they're doing and you ultimately get the minimum cost and the uh, maximum uh, smoothness of the process. So just for the final slide, looking at some of the technical detail uh, that Tim was asking about before. So in terms of emissions and immunity, and generally speaking, anything that you do to suppress an emission will also be beneficial from the immunity because it's generally reciprocal circuit. So if you're dealing with a, a, an interface, communications interface port, the devices you put to suppress emissions will also give you benefit in terms of stopping emissions from entering. But you do need to have, for example, if you've got a filter, you need to have a symmetrical filter. So it's got a series inductor and capacitors on either side. So it's a pi filter. So it works in both directions with equal effectiveness. So in terms of design tips, design in protective measures from the start and in particular, any interface communications portal that we have would have series ferrite bead chokes or series resistors followed by shunt bypass capacitors and where appropriate common mode chokes would give higher level of suppression at higher frequencies for a given component size vis-a-vis -vis a non-common uh, non mode choke. So build this in from the start and I can almost guarantee that if you have a switch mode power supply circuit and you don't do this, you will end up with an emissions problem, almost guaranteed. In terms of PCB layout, multi-layer ground plane type approach Multi-layer boards these days are not much more expensive than double layer boards and it's just worth it. Having that ground plane there gives you inherent suppression of emissions at their source. But one thing I haven't said specifically, try and, try and prevent emissions from occurring at the source of the emission. So the dot point there, if you have to start shielding, it's probably too late. And uh, we did a design that was assessed for a US company and they had a look at our design in a plastic box and I said, that can't possibly pass EMC, you don't have a shielding enclosure. And guess what, it passed with flying colours because we designed the circuit board, the circuits and the layout to prevent the generation of the emissions rather than create the emissions and then try to suppress them. And if you start shielding with shielded enclosures and so forth and so forth, you have a, generally have a major problem. I mean, there are some exceptions, for example, shield cans over RF circuits on circuit boards. Uh, are quite effective at that local suppression or prevent, preventing radiation ingress. 
but if you have a circuit board that's radiating like the proverbial star and you think I'll oh, we'll just stick it in the shielded box you'll probably find yourself in a world of pain so both the circuit design and the circuit board layout is particularly critical and if the manufacturer gives you a recommendation for circuit board layout for switching regulator it pays to heed it but don't slavishly follow it necessarily because I actually have seen some recommended layouts that are not all that flash so you can sometimes do better than actually even a recommended layout but it's generally a pretty good starting point uh, your biggest enemy will be the switching regulator in most circuits followed by high speed digital logic circuits uh, if you have high speed digital logic circuits they have their own design challenges to make them function properly so the what you do for EMC also generally is necessary to make them actually function properly so in terms of uh, immunity is immunity yeah, sorry Jeff can you just explain what a high speed digital logic circuit is just for example a microcontroller with memory follow, running at a clock speed of 500 megahertz so your typical uh, high performance microcontroller that you might find in your cell phone device for example is a high speed digital circuit so it's really high frequency logic signals running at the um, tens of megahertz hundreds of megahertz rate that had very fast rise and fall times on the signal and these tend to generate oscillating circuits in spurious inductances in your track work that can then radiate signals into other parts of your circuit and then into the environment thank you so in terms of immunity in terms of esd in particular transient propulsion diodes are particularly important but also a layered offenses so on a ESD susceptible signal input we'd put a suppression diode then a series impedance either a resistor of tolerable or a ferrite bead followed by clamp diodes to typically pass supply rails and also make sure, look at the current path is that electrostatic discharge going to flow through a circuit that powers your microcontroller or can you bypass it to earth by some other means and similarly for radio signals coming in or mains born transients always have a look at how you can suppress the signal at its point of entry into circuit but also if that generates current flowing from the protection device where does that current flow and the first point about power rails engineers will often put clamp diodes to power rails to bypass incoming transient signals thinking that that power rail is going to absorb all of that transient without ill effects Quite often all they're doing is transferring the transient onto their power rail where the impact gets even worse. And voltage regulators generally sink current, source current, they don't sink current. So be really aware of using clamping devices, generally only for high impedance signals where the main energy is being absorbed by the transient absorbing diode. And uh, in bold at the bottom, do pre-count compliance testing and don't submit to a test lab unless you're sure, sure you're going to pass or you'll buy yourself a world of pain and expense. So gone one minute over, no time for questions. Well, that is, that is a shame, Jeff, because, you know, we've got like a thousand questions hanging here because EMC is such an exciting topic. Yeah, um, I'm happy to stay on as long as it takes to address any questions. Yeah, no. Um, um, no, look, if anybody does have any questions, put them out um, now. But, Jeff, if you could stop sharing because I will share mine. Oh, oh, you've got that there. Unless that's what you're about to share. Yeah, no, I've, I've just updated this mine. So if you could just stop sharing and I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see that, Jeff? Uh, it hasn't come up yet. Now it has. Yeah. So, uh, look, it is a detailed topic, um, and Jeff's done such a great job of explaining it. I'm not surprised there aren't any questions at the moment, but if you do have any questions, um, you can contact Jeff directly on his email there, and I would just um, make the point that he is very, very generous with his time, no obligations to engage with Genesis. If you've got a question, just shoot it through to him. That's his community um, uh, contribution. There are a few questions here actually um, coming in. Uh, 
Luke asks, are EMC regulations particularly different between normal electronic devices and medical electronic devices? And if so, what is it? Most of the standards there, firstly, globally harmonise, and secondly, the medical regime is drawing upon the, the commercial standards. So the actual standards themselves and the limits and thresholds and so forth and the measurements you need to do are very much in common between the two. Where there is a divergence, there are some specific things for medical, for particular environments that have differences, but the predominant difference is in, is in the risk profile that you adopt. And that impacts predominantly the immunity assessment. In other words, what is the tolerable disruption to your device? But once you've done that and you've said what the acceptable ill effects are, generally speaking, the standards are very common between the two. Excellent. Matt has asked a question. Antenna and EMC has always been a bit of a well, engineering black art, and most of it comes through experience. It is worth, is it worth employing multi-physics CAD tools such as COMSOL to model and simulate during design phases, for example, an onboard PCB RF antenna to see if the generated radiated RF fields and their strength, or is it quicker and cheaper to build a number of different configurations and actually measure it? And further, is it better to use off-the-shelf pre-compliant modules or design it from the ground up? I've not used those analysis tools, so I really can't comment on their veracity or otherwise. If I were to be doing an extremely high-speed logic, digital logic circuit, I would be tempted to commission someone on a higher pay grade than me to do that work for that design. But most of the designs that we deal with at Genesis don't actually have those high-speed components. They're built into the system on chip devices, so that's under the hood stuff we don't actually have to worry so much about. In that domain, it's usually just sort of heuristic experience. You know what works and what doesn't. Generally, is sufficient. Uh, if you're looking at intentional radiators and antennas and so forth and so forth, then definitely, uh, once, one, once again, engage with someone who's got a lot of experience and gut feel for that. And in those situations, simulation tools can be quite useful. But my experience with antennas if in doubt, nothing actually built knocking up a model and trying it. Um, it's your ultimate recourse. And sorry, what was the final one? And his comment was, is it better to use off-the-shelf pre-compliant modules or design it from the ground up? What uh, do you mean by an off-the-shelf pre-compliant module? What is that? You can get off-the-shelf off modules, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth modules, which come as certified compliant. Beware, they certainly take away a fair bit of the pain, but beware if you change anything, for example, the antenna, you still may have a compliance obligation for them. But normally in that instance, we would submit to the test lab all of the compliance information from the vendor and describe to the test lab the differences in our design. The, the test lab may then do an, an analytical process rather than testing process, particularly for the uh, spurious emissions, for example. So you, you may save testing but you still really do need to submit that to the test lab and get their imprimatur to sign off a test report that includes that analytical thing. Um, the trade-off is generally cost. To give you an idea, at Genesis, we use raw NRF and Nordic, for example, Bluetooth chips and run the full gamut of the compliance rather than using modules, and that's a cost-driven thing. But for Wi-Fi, we always use pre-compliance modules we can buy a pre-compliant Wi-Fi module for under five bucks. So why would you do anything else? Because for Wi-Fi compliance, it's a big deal. And one thing I haven't mentioned, you do actually have to ensure that you comply with the requirements of the controllers of those systems. And if you want to put your Bluetooth logo or your Wi-Fi logo on the thing, you have license fees to pay and other compliance obligations. So you do have to take that into account. But if you use pre-compliant modules, you basically solve that problem so it's a trade-off between size, power, space, and said we, we've settled on the fact we use Bluetooth chips by not using modules, but Wi-Fi, we always use modules. Excellent. Thank you very much.